Transnistria dreams of a Russian future. The region broke away from Moldova in the early 1990s and legally at least remains part of it. De facto, it's a self-governing separate entity, though unrecognized by any UN member state. Most of its half million inhabitants yearn to become part of the Russian Federation. Many, like Sergei, have Russian passports. No. Personally, I prefer to be with Russia, because I feel close to Russia. I was born in Russia, I speak the Russian language. Our future lies with Russia, is the message on the buses rolling through the capital Tiraspol. On the streets, those we spoke to shared that sentiment, even though there's no land border with Russia. The best solution is to unite with the Russian Federation. That's not only my personal opinion, but all people in Tiraspol and all over Transnistria think like that. Of course I want Transnistria to join the Russian Federation, because many Transnistrians go to Russia for work so they can make a living and feed their families. Moldova gave us nothing. Hundreds were killed in a brief but bloody separatist war in 1992 before Russia intervened. Some 1,200 Russian troops remain there. In Grigoriopol, we meet retired engineer Alexei, who shows us around a closed food canning factory. It used to employ up to 3,000 people, but breaking away from Moldova took an economic toll on Transnistria. The factory failed and people left. Many of the jobless went abroad, to Italy, Romania, some even to the USA, to Portugal. But most of them went to Russia or to Ukraine, because many people have relatives and family there. Some 50,000 exiled Transnistrians send money home from abroad. It helps keep the economy afloat. The region urgently needs investors. But who wants to put money into an unrecognized breakaway state? The closure of the factory is a tragedy. It's very painful. We can call it a tragedy that the military conflict destroyed the economy of this country, bringing down this company with it. At home, garden vegetables and a few pigs help Alexei and his family to get by. During the conflict, Alexei was among local Moldovans who fought against the separatists and for the territorial integrity of Moldova. His dream is Europe, not Russia. I want to see my grandchildren free and I want to see them move around freely, as it was in previous centuries, in a European open space where they'd be accepted, hopefully. But that's far from what the parliament in Tiraspol is planning. The chairman of the Supreme Soviet, as the assembly is called, has just pushed through a resolution calling on Russia and the UN to recognize Transnistria. Next on the wish list, annexation by Russia, which would require changing existing borders. We believe that the will of the people is the supreme factor. The people's will prevails over the principle of the integrity of borders, as was proclaimed in Helsinki in 1975. But I insist our goal should only be reached peacefully, by peaceful means. We don't want any violence. A major question in the debate is to what extent is there a Transnistrian identity? To find out, we drop into a rehearsal of the Viorica Ensemble. For years, they've been collecting traditional folk songs and dances in villages across the region. We asked the conductor about the roots of Transnistrian folk music. The main essence of the music, the essence of the melodies and also the harmonic structure of the songs are really very close to Moldovan sounds. Viorica tours abroad, but as Transnistrian passports aren't recognized, the cast uses others, Russian, Ukrainian, Moldovan. It's a reality check from the international community playing into the debate on Transnistrian identity. No. No, there is no border. They constructed some artificial borders. But we are one people, really one people. We share the same dances here all around in Transnistria and all over Moldova and also in Romania. Big business also looks eastward. The sheriff conglomerate, which is said to have links to Russian political and security interests, covers much of Transnistria's private sector, 
from petrol stations to supermarkets and even a football club. It bought players from Brazil and elsewhere. Its homegrown goalkeeper says the ultimate goal is to be in the Russian league. We would have excellent prospects in the Russian league. Probably not in the first year because you need some time to adjust to the level of the league. But in time, FC Sheriff could become serious competition for the top teams in Russia. Euronews accepted an invitation to the foreign ministry in Tiraspol, where the OSCE has relaunched talks in the wake of the Ukraine crisis. The foreign minister of this unrecognized state makes her policy objectives crystal clear. Transnistria will adopt Russian laws and join the Eurasian Customs Union. A European free trade agreement, she stresses, would be harmful. The signing of this free trade agreement between the European Union and Moldova will lead in the short term to a downturn of our industrial production of about 60%. That may not be the case if Transnistria itself joined the EU deal. Despite the anti-Western rhetoric from officials, three quarters of Transnistrian exports go west, but the benefits are lost on huge public spending deficits. Basically, it's about one billion dollars, which, uh, uh, which, um, which is the trade deficit of Transnistria, and this one billion dollars is financed, is supported through this uh, financial support from uh, Russian Federation. Uh, a subsidized economy is not sustainable by definition. Education is another delicate issue. Moldovan language schools are caught in the crossfire. In February, Transnistrian authorities seized salaries paid to teachers by the Moldovan government. The money was given back three months later. We are harassed because Moldova intends to sign the association agreement with the European Union soon. Back in the Moldovan capital Kisinau, the Erinomenko family is desperately seeking help. We meet them at a human rights lawyer's office. Vitaly Erimenko is serving 12 years in a Transnistrian jail after being convicted of fraud by separatist authorities. His sister tells us he was forced to sign a confession. His lawyers say they know of several hundred similar cases and have filed complaints at the European Court of Human Rights. They threatened to kill him. They set up a mock execution. He was brought outside the police office by the river. He was given a shovel and was told to dig his own grave. They even fired gunshots at his legs and above his head to scare him to death while he dug his grave. Police, the judiciary, the economy and trade. In many areas, Transnistria urgently needs deep and comprehensive reforms, either as part of the Russian Federation or not.